teens one usually sees in Benghazi or Kabul, reminding the Kosovars that, quote, the EU will not let this issue drop from the attention, and one can't make extreme, extremists disappear by ignoring them. Further, arguing that there are many people, many more than those frustrated hooligans with beards, who believe in rules and laws and believe that they deserve to be Europe, that we are Europe, that we want the economy entrenched in Europe and personal freedoms like in Europe, end quote. This needs to prove Europeanness being the very evidence that Kosovars are not necessarily perceived as such, or at least not until they have fully escaped their Islamic association in past. Thus, as Muslims are called to take sides in an imaginary clash of civilizations, they are also made to feel inadequately European, who must continuously furnish the European disbelieving gaze with credentials to corroborate their Europeanness. The key feature of this debate is that Kosovar Islam is tolerant, secular, European, and unlike other Islam further east, Kosovar Islam does not pose a threat to Europe, but is of Europe. According to this reading of Kosovar Islam, Kosovo Muslims produce, are produced as possible European subjects as long as they renounce Wahhabism and embrace LGBT rights as proof of their loyalty to the European <coughs> project. Who rights discourse then becomes the designated test for good Muslims who are invited to belong to Europe for the expulsion of other Muslims who must remain squarely outside. Gay rights discourses then, as Mopshin et al. have argued, quote, offers a language for the critique of Islam and multiculturalism, an idiom that underscores an Orientalist discourse that renders Muslim citizens noble and produces them as objects of critique, end quote. In Kosovo, the perceived tension between Islam and queer rights is then resolved by explicitly advocating the expulsion of bad Wahhabi Muslims and the inclusion of LGBT members in the process of becoming European. Finally, there is one more consideration that needs to be addressed when discussing queer activism in Kosovo beyond both of the mentioned issues, but interrelated to them. Majority of the LGBTI activism in, that is given visibility in Kosovo is funded and run by foreigners, either Western Europeans or regional activists. For instance, the EU-funded project Challenging Homophobia, the largest in Kosovo, is run by the Slovenian LGBTI organization Lega Vitra. While Kosovo 2.0 is funded by a Dutch natural, national in cooperation with the Kosovar national, both heterosexuals, without any representation of the queer community, yet at the very center of the queer debate. It's important to ask them who speaks about sexuality in Kosovo, who is silenced and who is heard, reflecting on positionality of who and how one speaks in the name of queers and Muslims in Kosovo, what is made visible in these productions of knowledge against the invisibility of loss, displacement, violence administered on Muslim and queer bodies leads me to Elizabeth Friedman's brilliant observation that while some cultural practices are given means to continue and voices to speak, others are squelched or silenced and allowed to die. Finally, as the regulation of gender and sexuality is increasingly guided by normalization as opposed to repression, it has attempted to erase alternative histories, subjectivities, futurities of becoming and belonging. The normalization of gender and sexuality into the hegemonic fold of heteronormativity, fixed identities, continues to rely on the pathologized, on pathologizing disabled and trans bodies, Muslims, migrants, people of color, women, and the prokaryotas, producing them as suspects others who must be surveilled, homogenized, desexualized, and depoliticized as a way of accommodating Euro-Christian secular heteronormative anxieties, particularly fears of Muslims, racial and migrant others, whose political visibility then in any form necessitates either violence or their silencing. In the meantime, normalization of violence on Muslims is so pervasive worldwide today that it has become invisible. The portrayal of Muslims as uncontrollable, wild and violent further calls for their control through violence. Treating LGBT activism in the European periphery, particularly in Muslim-majority countries, as unambiguous, linear process of good secular gays versus bad extremist Muslims, silences alternative sexualities, subjectivities, and living strategies, while legitimizing Islamophobia and the continued violence over Muslims worldwide. LGBT activism in Kosovo, along with the EU-oriented local liberal elite, continues to utilize Islamophobia to address the proclivities of European racism and anti-Muslim sentiments. 
preemptively accommodating European anxieties over the integration of Muslim majority countries into the EU. The direct correlation of Wahhabis and homophobia is generally employed as a tool to reinforce binary opposites between Europe and Islam. Moreover, these binary opposites ignore intersectional subjectivities, such as queer Muslim who identify with both Islam and queerness, or fail to acknowledge the overall complexity of queerness as a space beyond normalized, theorized, or codified identities. I'm almost done. <laughs> the support for the LGBT community by the government in Kosovo is employed both as a measure of defense as well as a proof of Europeanization. The modality of defense here is deployed to distance Kosovo from their already perceived non-Europeanness by cutting off ties with the Ummah on the one hand and by embracing queer rights as loyalty and conformity to the European project on the other. The EU desire for clarity in the Balkans then works through the continuous production of Muslims as non-Muslims, as secular, as nominal. The representational praxis of queers in Muslim majority countries under siege by the externally indoctrinated Wahhabi extremists operates by a desire to produce a converging queer and secular Muslim alliance which can preemptively resist the suspect Muslim who in being anti-queer may actually be anti-European. In this constellation of European expansionist politics, Muslims are all produced as victims, but given distinct identities. While the queer and secular Muslim is the victim of the Muslim extremist, the Muslim extremist too is a victim of the foreign Wahhabi influences, all of which, deprived of any agency, can find protection and salvation into the European Union. Queer Muslims in the Balkans, then, who have no alternative futures or possibilities but the future of European integration at the expense of negating new possibilities of being and becoming outside the confines of notions of European sexual citizenship. I want to end by asking how can we start to think of sexuality outside the confines of European hegemonic constructs and expansionist politics? More importantly, can we locate queer rights discourse not as a space of conflict and confrontation, a key feature of Euro-American queer politics of transgression, but as a possibility of intersectional cooperation. This task requires not only the continued exposure of the Islamophobic nature of European expansionism <coughs> and professed exceptionalism, the universalizing and universalist hegemonic politics of sexual liberation, but also the articulation of a post-liberal undoing of fixed spatial and temporal identities who operate beyond the coercive politics of transnational European governmentality. Thank you. Uh, there's also the notion of homo-colonialism in your, in your paper, 
I, I don't think you mentioned it this time in, in, in your talk, but it's in the paper. And what is striking to me is that all these you know, uh, concepts describe uh, a, a particular kind of structuring unequal power relation. So uh, Orientalism produces the Muslims as problematic and in need of regulation. Um, uh, homonationalism brings into being a particular form of queer in, uh, in Kosovo, and I do think this is, this poses a lot of, uh, of, of uh, questions, especially when it comes to the question: What is the reality uh, on the ground? My experience is that these totalizing accounts that, that, that you know that, that is part sometimes of the homonationalist analysis uh, starts start falling apart as soon as you uh, uh, start looking at what happens in the context of, uh, of the everyday and also everyday political conversations. Just a small example from my own work, when you talk to young Muslims or, or young immigrants in the Netherlands, not, not immigrants, young Dutch people from a Muslim background uh, in the Netherlands uh, now is starting to um, organize around to, uh, uh, themes of LGBT activism and queerness, you see that they have a kind of critical engagement with homonationalism. They embrace it partly. Yeah. So this already destabilizes this, this sense in, in the, the, the sometimes socializing, sometimes binary logic of homonationalism that has victims and has uh, perpetrators. It's very difficult, and it's also impossible, at least I, I, this is my view, to say, no, 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 but you cannot embrace Dutch uh, discourse of tolerance to these people who are carving out a space for, for political activism for themselves. So this is <coughs> more of a general issue with the whole concept of homonationalism, and especially how it travels, how it is being <coughs> because many, the way people use it is actually far removed from the way who are uh, uh, introduced in 2005 and later in the book in 2000. Seven. So questions that I would like, in, in relation to your uh, paper, would like to see answered is, so why do people in Kosovo and other parts of Europe get involved in LGBT, LGBT politics in, uh, in Kosovo? And this is an empirical question. So we cannot assume that it is because uh, of EU washing. We cannot assume that it is because there is, the, the Europe has to produce, I mean, this is not the way also people uh, act in the world. Yeah. So, of course, this analysis is, uh, is helpful, but I think that there is also reason for a more open, um, ethnographic kind of research, asking why do people get involved, actually, what is their own discourse um, for, for getting involved, and that sort of break, that, that would constitute a break with the kind of socializing uh, logic of, uh, of the homonationalism uh, concept. And one last point. Uh, in this is you rightly argue, of course, that within the whole nationalist context in Europe, certain same-sex sexualities that coincide with liberal subjectivity are selected to be defended, as you, as you call it. While other articulations of same-sex sexuality, of course, disappear from view, it has to do with class and all the things that you uh, mentioned. But I would like to know, and this is also, again, um, sort of call for, for even more <coughs> empirical uh, data because it's already empirically rich. But uh, who, are, who then are these others? What kind of other articulations of same-sex sexuality do you encounter or do we see in, um, in Kosovo? Because that's a very important point. It would make you, your, your argument much uh, even, even stronger than it, all, than it already is. So I have more to say. I, I have doubts about the eu washington concept, I have to say, because I do, I do not think, it seems to me, as far as I can See that the relationship between the EU and Kosovo is like the relationship between Israel and, and Palestine. Maybe uh, you can convince me. Should I answer first? Okay. Um, I don't. I mean, I don't think the relationship between the EU and the Kosovo is identical to Israel and Palestine, but it's similar in that Kosovo is under. EU direct supervision, unlike other, let's say, post-Yugoslav spaces, with the exception of Bosnia. So it's also very interesting to note how, if, if after World War II, it was the aggressor states that were placed under international supervision, such as Germany and Japan and so forth, and Italy even, 
But in post-Yugoslav wars, it was Muslim-majority countries that were placed under international and later EU supervision. So what calls for this trajectory in international relations more broadly? Um, I think to answer your first question, why do people in Kosovo get involved in LGBT activism? I don't know if maybe didn't come across, but my intention is not to suggest that LGBT activism is fully sponsored by Western Europe, but that there are no local ground group, grassroots initiatives. There are. I think in majority of cases that get visibility, however, are LGBT initiatives that get either co-opted by the EU or they take on LGBTQI issues because there's money and funding coming from the EU on these issues, such as the case with Kosovo 2.0. So I'm not suggesting that there is no grassroots organizations and that there are people in Kosovo who I'm not questioning actually, people who, I, who may identify as LGBTQI. I mean, I even think queer itself is a hegemonic formation. So it's not like LGBTI is less or more in that sense. Um, I'm just saying that these initiatives inevitably get co-opted into the uh, European homo-nationalist agenda of expanding in Muslim-majority countries by creating the idea of queers as victims who can only be saved by belonging to Europe. So it kind of creates this dividing <coughs> line. And what this does then, it exposes those people who reject, who in rejecting queer rights may reject Europeanization itself. Um, on alternative sexualities, I think I've, I've, I've thought about it extensively. It's, it's, a, it's also a very problematic uh, concept, partly because not all subjectivities or identities seek visibility in the first place. Okay, that's cool. um, the problem that I had, for instance, with the Coming Out project that the EU organized in Kosovo is that there's a group called Ichtidia Dilberi, which is a um, Muslim um, group of, um, let's say, queers, although they don't like to be called queers, um, who have who work through inviting people in as opposed to coming out. So it's a tightly knit group of people who want to share their sexuality um, or their, let's say, private life uh, with people whom they choose to as opposed to society and wise, operating through what they believe are Islamic notions of piety, modesty, and sexuality. So that's just one example. But there may be many others who don't necessarily feel the need to publicly articulate their sexuality, particularly in the larger discourses of LGBTI. So um, yes, there are alternative sexualities who are not understood or embodied in the LGBTQI framework. Um, but that, and it would be an interesting project, but I also think it would be a very problematic project. Indeed. So, how many people? <coughs> start with you and then Kenneth. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much for this. Uh, I look forward to the entire chapter. I just wanted to say that um, some of the experience that I've had in uh, looking at feminisms in post-socialist Muslim contexts in Bosnia, with a colleague working on the same topic in Kosovo, was that there was some kind of an understanding of the women that we interviewed that uh, the Muslim community, and from my personal experience of the Jewish community, uh, do live in um, Christian morale, so to the European Christian morale, and that, uh, that they already feel as the others within, within, uh, within Europe. And uh, one good example uh, of how this is often misunderstood by the international community, if I can label them briefly in that way, is when the Dayton Peace Accords were signed, I remember that an American politician in December said, <coughs> Well, this is so good, such good news, that uh, in uh, Herzegovina and Bosnia, the peace accords are, are being signed just before Christmas. I'm so happy. <laughs> Forgetting that uh, you know, Christmas on the 25th of December is significant for maybe 17% of the, of the population of Bosnia and not for Bosnia and Herzegovina, not for the other 83%. Uh, the question I would uh, be interested to hear is, um, as a middle-aged uh, woman who was an adult uh, before Yugoslavia fell apart, uh, have you at all looked at uh, the whole um, Yugoslav discourse 
and its effect on the whole Muslim identity, LGBT identity, etc. Thank you. Maybe, uh, well, uh, I oppose this idea of home nationalism because it's so dichotomous, right? like you said also, Paul, on the, as a critique. And I would say in the Dutch uh, context, I find it also very problematic uh, because I would say the dichotomy doesn't exist because I would say the Dutch are not so pro-homosexual. So I would say it's more, much more problematic at one side this idea of the euro washing of, I would say, that, that I would say the West is so pro-gay or pro-queer. And then the other side, that I would say, uh, eliminate a little bit the problem that exists with Muslims in the so program. I would say that both sides there is a lot of, I would say, homophobic problems there. And it may be not entirely entire but I would say the gays are still, I would say, also the lesbians, and the lesbians are still second-rate citizens. And there is, I would say, very much an essentializing role of this, also very much focusing on one kind of homosexual. And so there's many problems, I would say, at both at the, at the Muslim side and at the white side. And the white side is also not secular, for example. And that's the idea of the secularization process. I doubt it. Yeah, so I would say, indeed, you should do much more research on the ground. And I would say people should very much go for their own, I would say, situational and pragmatic uh, solutions instead of having, I would say, this very general ideas about uh, uh, pain washing or whatever you have. So because of the case, also, for example, if you look at uh, the Yugos former Yugoslavia, all these countries have their different histories. And I would say if you go to Russia, there's a sort of different history. Maybe one more uh, question for Paul, and then you two more. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not, it was going to be a question, but I think you answered it. First, I mean, I think this is brilliant what you're doing. And every time I read your work and listen to you, I think new things are coming. And Paul added a lot more, I think, about this, this tension between kind of looking at discourse and everyday practices. Um, but what you've done is beautifully decentered even more the kind of fake logic that Sanya and, um, and Boyan put forward about West and then East. Because the whole point of a post-colonial approach would be that first you decenter, but then you argue that there are multiple centers and that you work from multiple centers through multiple paths. And that seems to me to be an extraordinarily important thing. And then you went even further, because you said, what if some of those paths are not about visibility and being loud and about coming out? And I, and I actually think that this is, this is actually a real challenge to all of us who claim to be in some kind of progressive spheres in, in this space and these spaces. So the, the question was going to be, you know, if you answer your own question at the end, where would be the literature, not, not what's the future research project, because I agree with, uh, just don't go there. But what would be the literature? Where would we be looking for the historical decentering or radical, radical repositioning of some of these things? <laughs> one last question. And then that was one sentence. Then after the so we decided that uh, like the EU is interfering in Kosovo internal affairs. I think there was a recent, I think I read it from the lesbian activist from Kosovo, Ipo, or how is she called it? Yeah. She was exactly saying the same thing. We do not need foreigners telling us how to organize mm -hmm. stuff. So that should be like from the ground. Uh, but like when you talk about Europe and Islamophobia, I think it's very, how do you say, very complex and it really depends on the national level because you, we have this hierarchy of identity, you might be first a national identity and then a European identity and then within the national identity you have a majority or a minority. So, if we, um, so when you talk about, um, let's say, Catholics and seculars, if you look at the, uh, what Croatia had during this referendum, there was a conflict between, let's say, the liberals and the conservatives. And they were really, like I would say, they were really clear, like who is pro-gay and who is anti-gay. But now when the decision to Charlie uh, to Syria, you can actually <laughs> see that the, this liberal Croats, who are more European, they are more ready to identify <coughs> that, that just like, I would say, just like the tendency. But I also think that Muslimophobia would be more present in countries in Europe where Muslims as, a, as groups are an uh, important minority. And these are only these industrial countries of the core. So where, where, like France, Germany, and the Benelux, and Denmark. Everybody else has other minorities. And, and this is not 
long lived in it. Mm -hmm. Right, so in Croatia, like only if you have a personal trauma from Bosnia <coughs> or people think about Muslims, otherwise it's Serbs or Croats, and it's Catholics versus Orthodox, no mention of Islamophobia. Yeah. 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 So this is just like continuous and all of that. Okay, you know. um, thanks, thank you. Yeah, uh, I, I was just Quickly, I was just going to uh, refer first to the literature of decentering the debate. There's brilliant work by Saba Mahmoud called Politics of Piety, the Islamic Revival of the Feminist Subject, where she looks at, um, I mean, she does, it's an ethnographic research where she practically looks at, or challenges rather, human agency as primarily consisting of confronting the social norms, and she looks at change from within the already established institutions. It's a, it, it's a brilliant work. Um, the Yugoslav discourse on Muslim identity, I've looked at uh, briefly, and I'm actually working simultaneously on a paper on the establishment of Balkan Islam. So for instance, uh, Xavier Bugarel, who is an authority on Islam in the Balkans, who has written extensively about Islam in the Balkans, has come up with this term of Balkan Islam, and the, the idea that there is such a thing as Balkan Islam, of course, it's a myth, uh, partly because there, there's multiple Islams at the same time as Islam claims, univers claims universality, but what I'm trying to question by looking at how in Yugoslavia, even since the 1960s, there was the beginning of an articulation of Yugoslav Islam being somewhat different from the crazy Islam out there. So, and then this becomes even more strongly articulated way until the 1980s where you have the Sarajevo process uh, and the Islamska Deklaratia uh, that practically shakes uh, the entire foundations of this discourse on Balkan Islam because of course they're influenced by the Khomeini or Khomeinist ideas of Islamist politics of liberation and so forth. And then they get thrown in jail and then in the late 1980s of course you have the reemergence again of post-socialist Balkan Islam uh, being used to prevent Muslims in the Balkans, not just in Bosnia, but in Kosovo, in Albania, in Macedonia, um, to prevent them, and even Bulgaria, to prevent them from um, re-establishing ties with the Ummah, particularly when the international community and the Europeans saw that there was an increased cooperation. In other words, the direction towards which uh, at least some Muslims were looking at was certainly not Brussels after the collapse of communism, but I would say Istanbul, I would say Mecca, I would say Cairo. So this, this, this fear that these guys are somewhat, this is, this, is, this is essentially fucking with us projects in the Balkans as being part of Europe, right? So um, Balkan Islam then, in, in, the, in the research that I've been doing, I've looked at over, sorry, over 200 conferences in the last 10 years sponsored by various EU and European state ac academic and assemblages, what not, on conferences on what is Balkan Islam and how Balkan Islam is so different from the rest of crazy Islam for the East. So I think it's borderland politics of the EU that seeks to practically create a very clear sanitary line. Okay, thank you very much. So how urgent is your question? Yes, <laughs> I can see it. Yes. Okay, the last question. Okay, I just wanted to say, how do you look your uh, concept of, of homonationalism through masculinity and femininity. And another thing, I think it would be really uh, interesting to uh, to engage a viewpoint of asylum rights, because when Slovenia was in the European Union, it didn't grant asylum to gays from Kosovo. They were nearly beaten and killed up. So it's this uh, paradoxes. And also that uh, nowadays, European Union, for instance, Germany and all, grants asylum only to those that come from uh, other places of the world that say, yes, we are fond of homosexuals. So these paradoxes should be very, very good, I think. And I very support this critique, yes. And I want to add uh, one question. Uh, how, how do you feel about this thing? Because when I'm you know, listening to you, I cannot understand everything I'm not but I feel, you know, because uh, I, I, I was reminded of, of my feelings being on that 4th of December 2012 when Krishna and it was fear and then anger. But, and then I have, you know, when I listen to you, I feel this is not an academic who is outside of this team talking about this. 
that you are inside of that issue of the issues you're talking about. This is about from your body. So thank you, and if, can I answer that? One? Yes. I I I totally agree. I was with the protesters. So what is interesting is that when the protesters, because the, the visual field in Kosovo and in Bosnia even, is so charged with Islamophobia that the first thing that people will say is Wahhabis, Muslim extremists and so forth. And I want to say that in the group of 100 to 200 people, there were not only Muslims, there was me as a queer person also protesting against this very Islamophobic discourse. Of course, some of the people in the group attacked physically, which I don't support, and we distanced ourselves from it together with other members, and we left right there and then when it totally got out of control and out of hand. So, um, it, it's also, it's, what I'm trying to say is that this, from an everyday perspective, it's become impossible to articulate yourself as both queer and Muslim, or to even, after the attacks, approach Muslim communities who prior to the attacks were very sympathetic, sympathetic in the sense <coughs> that, um, so for instance, two mosques in Pristina who uh, were very much open to people by arguing that this is a house of worship, we don't ask people who they sleep with, it's irrelevant to us. After the attacks, um, that also became inaccessible. So, uh, that's two things. That's it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs>